Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, what an amazing year we've had for women since we were last gathered here in Oxford 12 months ago. The Me Too and Time's Up movements have led to hundreds of men losing their jobs, and in some cases, their reputations, and millions more rethinking their behavior all over the world. In the last 12 months, yes. In the last 12 months, Saudi women have won the right to drive. Serbia has got its first female prime minister. Chile has at least partially raised the ban on abortion for the first time. And as women rise, so the rules on gender conformity are rewritten, making space too for transgender people to step forward. A small town, a small town in Canada became the first to elect a transgender female mayor. And young people, young women, are stepping up to leadership like never before. The horror of the Parkland school shooting had an equal but opposite reaction. The student activism of young women, like 18-year-old Cuban-American Emma Gonzalez, and girls like 11-year-old African-American Naomi Wadler. Their maturity having a sobering effect on a country drunk on guns. I know you want to clap each one of these moments, and they all deserve that applause in their own right. On International Women's Day just two weeks ago, Rebecca Solnit, she wrote, this is a revolt for which we have been preparing for decades. Or perhaps it is at the point at which a long, slow, mostly quiet process suddenly became fast and loud. And so the world, also the Skoll World Forum, now it's time for women to lead. You are about to meet three extraordinary women leaders from South Africa, from Costa Rica, and from Koti Ching First Nation. Who better to kick us off than the executive director of UN Women. From Zile, Malambo, Nguka, began her career as a teacher in her native South Africa, but rose to become deputy president under Mbeki, where she oversaw anti-poverty initiatives with a particular focus on women. She is no stranger to British universities. She completed her PhD on education and technology at the University of Warwick. But my notes say that she hasn't defended it yet. I can't imagine what she's been up to. I think the, I think the UN have been keeping her quite busy these last five years. Please welcome the ultimate woman's woman from Zile. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. So nervous following after President Kata, what a hard act to follow. <laughs> and he said everything I wanted to say and much better. <laughs> so have mercy on me. <laughs> Thank you very much to the Skoll Foundation for the forum, for having us here, and for being one of the shining lights of our time. In 2018, Google reported that the world searched women's rights 700% more than it would they would normally see a search about this concept in the month of January 2018. I guess this suggests that there's an increased interest in issues and the subject of women's rights. I think it was guys searching, because I think women knows what women's rights are. <laughs> but you know, better late than never, hey. <laughs> this also could mean that there is an effort to be part of the journey that would ensure that the women does respect women's rights. 
but we cannot be complacent. We cannot say because there is this upsurge of interest, we have arrived and we have a journey that we've been traveling, getting to an end. I think we should see this as a moment that you should be turning into a tipping moment because we know that it would take much more for us to change the systems and the structures that impinge gender e equality. But we also have to be opportunistic when we see a moment, turn it into something formidable. When we look at sexual harassment and abuse, and I want to focus just on sexual violence, sexual harassment and abuse just at work because it's much more difficult for people like us to deal with it at home. But workplace is an institution. This is a workplace hazard. Like if there isn't an air condition at work, someone has to take responsibility to do something about it to fix it and be accountable. So it should not be left to the women to fight for themselves. It should also not be left to the perpetrator to decide how they are going to deal with it. Perpetrator must take responsibility, but the institution, the Department of Labor, the minister responsible for employment, the shareholders, the customers, all have a stake in making sure that we bring about systemic change. Here, as we sit in this room, we also have a stake in seeing progress because of our proximity, both to the issues and to the, and to, to the institution. We have proximity to each other. It is a luxury not to be able to use our proximity to each other to bring about change that comes with the power of our collaboration. We have proximity to the women and girls that we seek to support and to ensure that they are not abused in any manner. We have proximity also to the powers that be in different ways. We have proximity also to the informal power that has come with the issue, with, with the era of the social media where no one has to elect you to have hits of people listening to you in their thousands and their million. That is the power that we all have proximity to. So we must and we can use this different opportunity and levels of proximities, if there's a word like that, in order for us to be the change that we can be. Some time back, in my other life, I was a minister of mines and energy in South Africa. That was at the time of the height of blood diamonds, especially in Angola, DRC, and Sierra Leone. Even though in my country, the problem was not as significant, it was dilapidating for me to see how, what was happening in those countries. Not, also, not only was the problem of abuse of rights and deaths and killing and disruptions of communities, but those governments also had no revenue to collect because this one resource they had that they could use to run their economies was slipping through their hands because of the way it was traded. But you know, diamond is a dirty business. You have the buyers, the miners, the sellers, the processors, and any odd person in between. And in order for us to stop the seepage, you needed to bring everybody inside for us to, to address the issue of blood diamonds. To cut the story short, we ended up with something that is called the Kimberley process. Some of you may know about it, which helped us to track the diamonds from the mine to the finger and to market so that we, could, we were able to separate illegally traded 
diamonds. That for me is one of the many complex processes I've ever been, I've ever been involved in. But at that time, there was so much concern in the world about the issue. There was a tipping moment, an opportunity, but that no country could do anything about by itself. We needed to come together, force someone, everybody inside the tent, and take the matter forward. On the issues of gender equality, we need everybody inside the tent in order for us to pull all the strengths together because we are all affected in different ways. Today is the day is a equal pay day. Another injustice that needs complex solution. And yet, there's a potential tipping point. It depends what we do and can do with the moment. Today, the average uh, on the uh, equal, in, uh, equal pay gap in the world is 23%. It gets worse if you are a woman of color, indigenous, disabled, and in some cases, your sexual orientation also makes a difference. This is a problem that has a solution. And frankly, this is robbery. The fact that women work as hard as men and they are not paid for selling their labor to the same bidder doing exactly the same work and the different laws that hinder women's economic remuneration of different, of different sorts requires all of us to be inside the tent, to use our proximity to the different stakeholders from trade unions who should be able at this point in history to be fighting as much for, for higher wages as it, it, it should be a fight for equal wages. Because once this issue is in the bargaining power, bargaining chamber, you actually believe, begin to deal with it in a different way. This is an issue again of customers who care about equality. This is an issue for shareholders. But just like the issue of sexual violence and the issue of equal pay are complex and significant, they also need all of us as society to come together because I feel we have reached a point in the struggle for gender equality, other than being exhausted as women because it has been hard. But we have reached a point where in South Africa, we would say this is a time for truth and reconciliation. But I want to call it the time for truth and correction. Because if you address the issue of sexual violence, staying with sexual violence at the workplace. Only about 10% of the women who are affected do report and have access to justice. If all the women who have been harassed were to stand up, can you imagine what would happen to companies? But that's not a reason to keep quiet and to leave women in that state. Someone has to lead from the front for a dialogue in nations to begin so that we can crack this situation and move on and make sure that there is just justice is served to women. If you think also about the issue of equal pay, some companies have said to me, we just don't have the money. So what should happen to women? Is this, should this be the rest of their lives? Must the women take one for the team? If you consider how much also shareholders are able to take for themselves, there has got to be a time when we sit down and we intervene and we say something has to be done. So these issues are complex, but they need answers. And you cannot leave it to civil society, women's organizations who only have blackguards sometimes to fight with, who have done everything in their power. Any person, any leader, any head of state, and the different institutions, including institutions such as religious institutions, 
need to be part of the tent because this is the tipping point where truth and correction has to happen in society. Let us take the issue of forced early marriage of children. Children that are being married off to people that are old enough to be their fathers, their grandfathers, and generally their caregivers. This is a practice that is sanctioned by society in the presence of their parents, sometimes governments, communities, traditional leaders, etc. To turn around this situation, we now know what are the building blocks and the interventions that are critical. There are people in this audience who have worked very hard to take us where we are today, where we're seeing, beginning to see the decline of the practice in some parts of the world. But we cannot leave the next generation and our children in this situation. This is a battle we have to win, and we are the ones that must mean win this generation, I mean this battle in this generation. But it does mean we have to bring everybody inside that can help us with solutions. One thing I learned from Nelson Mandela was the importance of working with people you disagree with when you need a solution. Many of these problems that have to do with gender, gender inequality do require that the people we disagree with need to be part of the solution, which is why we also reach out to men and boys, not because they have to protect women, because they have got to do their duty. And thankfully, there's an increasing number of good men who are making a difference, but not enough. We therefore, whether you're talking about ending violence against women at work and elsewhere, whether you are talking about addressing the issue of equal pay and the denial of women of the remuneration that they've worked for, whether you are talking about child marriage and forced marriage of children to people that are old enough to be their parents, these are complex issues and these issues have got answers and we need everybody to be part of finding a solution. We also need effective use of data and evidence so that we are able to work in a targeted way. We did a study towards the end of last year, tracking the implementation of the SDGs and the implementation and, and the impact on women and girls in 85 countries. And we are in particular looking at what is happening to poverty. We found that women between the ages of 24 and 35 remained the poorest people on earth. And the reason why, and this was in all countries, rich and poor countries. And the reason for that was because of motherhood, of the burden of care. Because at that age, they are struggling to raise a family on one hand, and they are trying also to settle in the labor market. They have older parents to look after, and they become leaders in their community. And any of the little things in the community and the big things that other people do not want to do, they end up with them. And for that, they get marginalized from active economic benefits. These women are young enough to actually start their lives all over again because they have a long life ahead of them. So it is important to take correctional action and to make sure that we can support them. What this means to us, and I think to many of you who follow this issue, is that the issue of the care economy and the burden of care has a significant impact on the future of our economies, but devastating impact on the lives of women. And these are some of the big challenges of our time that need us to find solution, not just to reduce, but actually to end these practices 
because in each one of them, where we find a solution, the benefits are there for everybody. If we end violence against women, we all know the upside of that. If we address unequal pay, we all know the upside of that for economies, for families, for health, for education. If we address unpaid care work, we also know the benefits and the upside. I chose those three examples to illustrate that some of these complex things for which our proximity gives us a unique possibility to provide solutions are killing our nations and yet this is, this is where lies the answers that can give us some of the big advantages that we need in society. So this is 2018. They are searching for the meaning of women's rights in an unprecedented manner. So there may be a moment only if we take the other steps. This is 2018. We are the first generation with a real possibility to address power relations between men and women in a, in a significant way. This is 2018, we have significant possibility to address poverty of women and girls in a significant way, even if we just focus to this age group of 25 and the F24 and 35. And this is 2018, we are the first generation, the last generation rather, who can do something significant to avert some of the fears that we have that would come for, for us not paying attention to the challenges of climate change. That makes us special. And that gives us significant and strategic proximity. And I think we should cherish our place in history. Thank you.